to start by giving just a simple sketch of this approach to the non-dual understanding. And this sketch or map will give us a context for all our meditations, contemplations and conversations. We start with our experience. Why? Because all we know is our experience. And the first thing we notice about experience is that it is always known by what we call I. I am hearing these words. I am feeling the temperature of the air on my skin. I remember traveling here yesterday. I remember my fifth birthday party. I slept well. I love you. I am feeling lonely. I is the central character in our lives. In fact, our entire lives revolve around what we call I. We think on its behalf. We feel on its behalf. We act, perceive and relate on its behalf. So, if we want to know the essential nature of our experience, we have to first know the nature of the one who knows it. So the first stage, the first of two stages, of this approach is the discovery of what we call I. So the first stage in this two-part process would be the discovery of the nature of I, the nature of that which knows our experience. This could be called the, the inward facing path. It is a path in which we trace our experience back to the knower which knows it, to the I that knows or experiences whatever it is we are experiencing. In the Vedantic, Vedantic tradition it is called the path of discrimination discriminating out what I essentially am from the multiplicity and diversity of experience. Having discovered or had a glimpse of the true nature of I, we then face outwards again. That is, we face the objects of the body, mind and world, thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions, and we re-evaluate them in the context of our new understanding. And this 
second part of the approach could be called the outward facing path. It is a path that was implicit in the Vedantic tradition, but was explained in more detail in the Tantric traditions. So both these approaches are included here. The inward going, the inward facing path, the path of discrimination, the return to our true nature. And then the outward facing path, the tantric tradition. In the inward facing path, everything apart from ourself is excluded. In the outward facing path, everything is included. It is a path of inclusion. And the first path is a path of exclusion. So that's just a, a very brief sketch. It will make more sense and I will fill out these two paths as we as we go on. So the, the inward facing path, the exploration and discovery of what I essentially am. If we do not know the nature of that which knows our experience, we cannot know the nature of anything that is experienced. If we want to know the nature of that which is experienced, the mind, the body and the world, we have to first know the nature of that which knows it. And that which knows it, that which knows our experience, is what we call I. So we start with this deep exploration of what we mean by the word I. In other words, what we mean by ourself. From the conventional point of view, I, our self, is considered to be the body-mind. And everything else is considered to be the other, the object, or the world. So when we say something like, I see the tree, what we mean is, I, this body-mind, is joined to an object out there in the world called a tree by an act of seeing. I love you. That me conventionally, I, this body mind, loves you, the other. Conventionally, whenever we say or think the word I, we are always referring to either the, the body and or the mind. I am tall. I am 47. I am married. I have three children. I am a doctor. I am feeling unwell. I am cold etc., etc., etc. All these are qualifications of I. And the I in this case is considered to be the body and or the mind.
So let us look first of all at the mind, body and world. And in this context I'm using the word mind in a more specific sense than I used it last night. Last night I used the word mind to include all experience, thinking, sensing and perceiving. In this context I mean mind in a narrower sense, just to mean thinking and imagining. It's a more conventional use of the word mind, thoughts and images. So just now go to your experience of the mind, that is, thoughts and images. Just allow a series of thoughts and images to appear and flow by, as it were, and then disappear. It doesn't matter what the thoughts or images are about. Notice that when a thought or image appears, it is always known. We are always aware of it. The thought or image appears to us like an object, not a physical object, a, a subtle object. And we know or are aware of that object. Now ask yourself the question, what is it that knows my thoughts? Don't answer it with a, an answer from the past, from theory, from memory, from what your culture has told you. Imagine that you don't have a past to refer to and refer only to your current, direct, intimate experience. When a thought appears, you are knowing that thought. What is this you? What is this I that knows or is aware of the thought? Now, since we have been sitting here for the last 20 minutes or so, dozens of thoughts have appeared and disappeared. And each of those thoughts was known by you. Or rather, known by what each of us refers to as I. Each of those thoughts has already disappeared. But the I that knows or is aware of this thought doesn't disappear when the thought appears. Sorry, when the thought disappears. Therefore the thought itself it doesn't go into the essential nature 
doesn't go into the make of the essential nature of I. If the thought was part of the essential nature of I, then when the thought disappeared, a little bit of I would disappear with it. But it is not our experience that a little bit of myself disappears every time a thought disappears. Nothing is Nothing essential is taken away from me when the thought vanishes. Therefore the thought itself doesn't go into my essential nature. So what I essentially am is not made of thoughts or images. I is that which knows or is aware of thoughts and images, but is not itself a thought or an image. Now, go to your experience of the body. And for this, I recommend closing our eyes. The only reason for this is that we're not addressing our perception of the world at the moment. With our eyes closed, our experience of the body is simply the current sensation. And I want to take some time to explain what I mean by the word sensation. It's very specific. If you go to the tingling at the soles of your feet, that's what I call a sensation. If you go to the feeling of slight density behind the eyes. That's a sensation. If you have a pain in your back, that is a sensation. If you're hungry, hunger is experienced as a sensation. If you're tired, There is a sort of heavy feeling in the body. That is a sensation. The sound of these words is not a sensation. It's a perception. I'll come to that later. One way of defining a sensation would be the way we feel the body, the way the body is felt from the inside. Go to the current sensation of the body. It's just a tingling, amorphous mass of sensation. We'll explore this in more detail (coughs) later, but for the time being, just go to the general amorphous, tingling sensation. And ask yourself, How long has this sensation been present? Has this sensation been present 30, 50, 70 years? No. 
a sensation, like a thought or an image, is something that appears and disappears. It may last a little longer than the thought or image, but <coughs> nevertheless, no sensation lasts very long. Just gently rub your fingers together. A new sensation appears. Stop rubbing your fingers together. The sensation gradually dissipates and vanishes. No sensation lasts long. We also see, hear, taste and smell the body. These are perceptions. None of these perceptions last long. In other words, we never experience a continuous body. We have the concept of a continuous body, a body that has lasted 30, 50, 70 years. But our experience of the body is a series of intermittent sensations and perceptions. Now ask yourself the question, what is it that knows or is aware of this flow of sensations? Whatever it is, is what we call I. I feel a headache. I sense the tingling behind my eyes. I am cold. What is it that is aware of all these sensations? Whatever it is that is aware of all these sensations is obviously not itself a sensation. Even since we have been sitting here, innumerable sensations have appeared and disappeared. But I have not appeared and disappeared with them. I am the ever-present, knowing or aware element of experience that runs continuous or remains ever-present throughout the appearance and disappearance of all bodily sensations. Thus what I essentially am is not itself made of a sensation. Sensations appear to me or in me, but I am not made of them. The third element of our experience is the world. We know the world through five sense perceptions. We see it, hear it, touch it, taste it and smell it. Just check first of all to make sure that this is true of your experience. Do you have any 
knowledge, and by knowledge I don't mean intellectual knowledge, I mean experiential knowledge. Do you have any experience of a world other than sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells? These are what I call perceptions. So perceptions, I use the word very specifically. Perceptions include sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells. It is our only knowledge of the world. That is our only experience of the world. Now ask yourself the question, how long does a perception last? For instance, start with your eyes closed. Open your eyes. Look around. Close your eyes. How long did that perception of the world last? Three or four seconds? Just go through all the five sense perceptions. Sights, sounds, tastes, textures, and smells. How long do each of these last? Thirty years? Fifty? Seventy years? or just a few moments. Have you ever experienced a continuous perception? Has any perception lasted throughout your entire life? That is, has any sight, sound, taste, texture or smell remained present throughout your life? Obviously not. In other words, we never experience a continuous world. We have the concept of a continuous world. But that concept doesn't refer to our experience. I'm not suggesting there is anything wrong with the concept. I'm not evaluating it. I'm just making it quite clear that the concept of a continuous world is not derived from experience. Nobody has ever had the experience of a continuous world. The apparently continuous world is made out of discontinuous or intermittent perceptions. These perceptions may last a little bit longer than our thoughts or images, but nevertheless they come and go. Just take some time to check that this is true of your experience. Our only experience of the world is perception and perceptions are discontinuous. Now ask yourself the question, what is it that knows or is aware of these perceptions? Whatever it is, is obviously what we call I. I am seeing this room. I am hearing these words. 
I taste the coffee. I touch the chair. I smell the flowers. I is the name we commonly give to that which knows or is aware of the world. And whilst each of these perceptions comes and goes, the I that knows them doesn't come and go with them. When a perception vanishes, for instance, when the sound of my voice vanishes, the I that knows it or is aware of it doesn't vanish with it. In other words, our perceptions, sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells don't go into the essential make of I. So the question remains, what am I then? I am not the thoughts and images that appear to me. I am that which knows or is aware of them. I am not my feelings or sensations. I am that which knows or is aware of them. I am not my perceptions. I am that which knows or is aware of them. What am I? I am simply that which knows or is aware. What I know or am aware of is not an essential part of what I am. All through our life, we have been knowing our experience. We have been aware of our experience. When we were five years old, ten years old, twenty, forty, sixty, I am aware of my thoughts. I am aware of my memories. I am aware of feelings. I am aware of all the sensations in my body. I am aware of the siren. I am aware of the world. I am aware. I am aware. I am aware. I am aware. It pervades all experience. In fact, the experience of being aware is the only element of experience that remains continuous throughout all experience. Just check that. Don't take it from me. Try to find any element in your experience apart from the experience of simply being aware that is continuous. Just start with 
the last 45 minutes. You have had innumerable thoughts. Perhaps not innumerable feelings, but several feelings. A whole flow of bodily sensations and numerous perceptions. None of these have lasted. If all there was to experience is a series of intermittent thoughts, sensations and perceptions, then we would experience, then our experience would be a, a series of fragments. Experience would be extremely agitated, starting and stopping, jerking on and off, all the time. Is that our experience? No. Whilst we have been sitting here over the last 45 minutes, there has been a continuity, a seamless flow. Well, our thoughts are not seamless. They start and stop. Feelings, sensations and perceptions are not seamless. They start and stop. What is the seamless, ever-present element of your experience? What is it that you can say from your own experience? This remains present. Just take the last 45 minutes. What has been present? as an experience, I don't mean as a concept. Only the experience of being aware. It's the only stable element of experience, the only continuous element of experience. And if you go back further, not just the f last 45 minutes, but you go back throughout your entire life, the only thing, and of course it is not a thing, that has remained present with you all your life is the simple experience of being aware. In fact, the simple experience of being aware is the only experience that cannot be removed from you. In other words, it is the irreducible, indestructible <coughs> element of our experience. Everything apart from the experience of being aware has, can, and will be removed from us. Every thought, every feeling, every sensation, and every perception will be removed, has been removed can be removed or will be removed from us. And yet, it leaves us, our essential nature, intact, undiminished. The simple experience of being aware is neither aggrandized by the appearance of any object, nor diminished by the disappearance of any object. It just remains stable, constant. Ever present in the background, so to speak, of our experience. This knowing element that runs, this knowing or aware element that runs throughout all experience.
know that in many cases the mind will already be objecting. What about deep sleep? The experience of being aware disappears then. What about anesthesia? What about death? What about before I was born? How can you say the experience of being aware is continuous? We'll go into this more in in our conversations. asking you to ignore those objections. It's very important to raise these objections. They deserve to be met. But just for the time being, bear with me. Acknowledge that at least since you woke up this morning. Acknowledge that something, the knowing or aware element of your experience has remained continuous throughout all experience. In fact, even before you woke up this morning, you were having a dream. What what is it that was aware of that dream? The same I, the same knowing I, that is now aware of this waking state experience. In other words, the experience of being aware didn't wake up this morning. It was fully awake, knowing your dream, while your body slept. We won't go further into deep sleep at the moment. In fact, why not? Let's go further into (laughs) deep (laughs) sleep. Just be open to the possibility that in deep sleep, the experience of being aware itself doesn't disappear. But that everything we are aware of disappears. Leaving just this pure being aware but being aware of nothing. After all, when we say, I slept well, we are referring to an experience. When somebody asks us, did you sleep well? In the morning, we don't guess, yes, I slept well. We know. I slept well. How come we know I slept well? What is it that had the experience of sleeping well? What is it that knows that experience? It is obviously I. I slept well. The experience of deep sleep is in fact the simple experience of being aware, without being aware of anything. Normally we think that in deep sleep I the experience of being aware disappears, but the body and the world remain. Our experience is in fact the opposite. When we fall asleep, it is the body and the world, that is, sensation and perception, that disappear, leaving I, the simple experience of being aware, 
alone by itself. It's called peace. The experience of being aware, just resting in itself. So the common name for the experience of being aware in the spiritual traditions is awareness or consciousness. Ness, the suffix ness means the presence of. So awareness means the presence of that which is aware. Or the being of that which is aware. The limitations of the words awareness or consciousness, and there are limitations to all the words that we use. But the main limitation of the word awareness or consciousness is that it is a noun. And it suggests that this that we are, this that we call I, the simple experience of being aware, is some kind of thing, albeit a very subtle, transparent thing, like an empty space. In fact, quite often, as you, many of you well know, awareness is likened to an empty space. Space is the subtlest object, or one of the subtlest objects that the mind can conceive. It is empty and transparent, but it is still an object. So for this reason we sometimes hear expressions like the space of awareness. There's nothing wrong with that expression. But the reason I take care explaining the meanings of these words is to be sure that when I use the word awareness or consciousness, you don't subtly imagine that I'm referring to some kind of object, some kind of thing. That's why I prefer the expression being aware. The experience of being aware. It's a little subtler than the word awareness. I will often use the word awareness, but please understand that I'm not referring, for instance, to a state of the mind. I'm referring to the knowing element, the aware element, which is itself empty of all objects. That is, it is not essentially made at for thought, feeling, sensation or perception. That is why sometimes awareness is described as empty or void. Sometimes it is called nothing. You might hear someone say, what I essentially am is nothing. That means what I essentially am is not a thing, not an object. That is not a thought, feeling, sensation or perception. What I am has no objective qualities. If this is misinterpreted, it can easily lead people to believe that non-duality is a kind of nihilistic doctrine. And indeed, some versions of contemporary Advaita are nihilistic doctrines. All that is meant when we say, I am nothing, is I am not something objective. I cannot be found. 
as a thought, a feeling, a sensation, or a perception. It is only legitimate to say, I am nothing, in reference to the previous belief, I am something. Most people believe and feel, I am something, that is, I am a body-mind, I am a collection of thoughts, images, feelings, sensations and perceptions. In relation to that belief, the I am something belief, it is legitimate as a step to say, I am nothing, I am not a thing. That which I truly am, the simple experience of being aware, is not itself a thing. What I am is this experience of being aware. Now when I say this experience, <coughs> I'm using it, the word experience in a very particular way. Normally when we talk of experience, we mean objective experience. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions. The mind, the body and the world. We could qualify these as objective experiences. The experience of being aware has no objective qualities. And yet at the same time it is an experience. It's what I call a non-objective experience. It's very easy to check this out for yourself. Ask yourself the question now. Am I aware? I trust the answer is yes. Now, when you heard the question, am I aware, you pause, you refer to your experience, and as a result you answer, yes, it is my experience that I am aware. We don't guess it, we don't believe it, we know it. We know the experience of being aware. Or rather, we are aware of the experience of being aware. Now, who is the we? When we say, I am aware that I am aware. I know that I am aware. What is the I that knows that I am aware? Is the I that knows that I am aware, different from the I that is simply aware? In other words, is the experience of being aware known by something other than itself? Is there another kind of awareness in you that knows the experience of being aware? Try to find these two awarenesses. One, the experience of being aware, and two, another kind of awareness that knows the experience of being aware. Can you find these two eyes? The I that is aware and the I that knows that I am aware. No. It's the same I.
I am aware is our primary experience. How do we know that I am aware? Because I am aware that I am aware. And the I that is aware is the same I that knows I am aware. In other words, awareness knows itself. Awareness is not known by some other kind of mind. Awareness is primary experience before it knows anything else like a thought, sensation or perception. It's primary experience is to know itself. But it doesn't know itself as an object in the way that it seems to know a thought, sensation or perception. In other words, it doesn't know itself in relationship, in subject-object relationship. The I that knows is the I that is known. This is what the Old Testament statement, I am that I am, means. The statement which Ramana Maharshi once said was the clearest, highest and most refined statement of non-duality there is. I am that I am. I, that's a shorthand version of I am that which is aware that I am aware. I know my own being by myself without the aid of any other agent. Now, what does awareness need to do in order to know itself? Where does it have to go? If I were to ask you now to stand up and take a step towards yourself, what would you do? It's like that for awareness. In order to know itself, it doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to direct its knowing towards itself. It's like asking, what does the sun have to do to illuminate itself? Its nature is illumination. <coughs> Just by being itself, it illuminates itself. For the sun to be itself and to illuminate itself is the same. Illuminating itself is not something that it does. It is what it is. It's the same for awareness. Knowing itself is not something it has to do. Just by being itself, it knows itself. <coughs> it is too close to itself to know itself in relationship. 
in order to know itself in relationship, it would have to separate itself from itself. Turn round and look at itself. It can't do that. Just as the sun can't separate itself from itself. Travel a few million miles into the universe and then turn round and shine on itself. In order to illuminate something other than itself, the sun must direct its rays away from itself towards that other planet. But in order to know itself, it doesn't need to shine its rays on itself. It is the illumination of itself. It is self-shining, self-illuminating. Likewise, awareness, in order to know something that is apparently other than itself, such as the mind, body or world, thought, sensation, perception. It must shine its knowing, shine its awareing, apparently away from itself towards that object. But in, and it does this by rising in the form of attention or the finite mind. But in order to know itself, it doesn't need to rise as attention or the finite mind. It knows itself simply by being itself. It is self-illuminating, self-knowing, self-aware. Please remember, I'm not talking about some extraordinary cosmic awareness which we don't have any contact with. I'm talking about the very knowing with which each of us is now knowing our experience. In other words, consciousness or awareness knows itself by itself, in itself, through itself, as itself. So we can say from our experience that what we call I is present and aware. The experience of being aware is its irreducible nature. Everything apart from the experience of being aware can be removed from us. But the experience of being aware itself 
is irreducible, indestructible. In other words, being and knowing go into the essential make of ourselves. When I say being and knowing, I don't mean that these are two elements. It's one quality, if we can call it a quality. Being aware or aware being, written all one word. We can say that this aware being or experience of being aware is empty. That is, empty of objects, full of itself, but empty of objects. It has no objective quality. It is self-aware. It is not, that is, it is not known by some other kind of mind or awareness. Its nature is to be aware. And just by being itself, it knows itself. That means that for each of us to know our essential nature is simply to be knowingly the presence of awareness. That is why it is said that simply being is the highest meditation. We cannot know ourselves as something, as an object. We cannot direct our attention towards ourself. Attention comes from ourself, just as light comes from the sun. That attention can only be directed towards something that is not ourself, just as the sun can only shine on something that is not itself. So, so the way to know our true nature of empty awareness is to be knowingly empty awareness. This is a little frustrating for the object knowing mind because the object knowing mind would like to know its source in the same way that it knows other things, that is, as an object, in subject-object relationship. It's not possible. To know ourself is to be ourself. And to be ourself <coughs> is to know ourself. That is why I think I said sometimes last night, true meditation is a non-practice. Now what else? can we say from experience about the nature of ourself? We have discovered that I am and that the I that I am is aware that I am. In other words, we have discovered that I is simply this experience of being aware or aware being. And that this experience of being aware is 
empty of anything other than itself. So, how are we going to find out more about ourself? When we normally want to find out about something, we direct our attention towards that something. If we want to learn about music, we direct our attention towards music. We want to learn about history, we direct our attention towards history. Whatever we want to know about, we direct our attention towards it. So here we want to know more about the essential nature of ourselves. Because until we know this essential nature of ourselves, that which knows experience, we cannot know anything that is true about the nature of experience itself. In other words, we cannot know anything that is true about the mind, the body, or the world until we know the nature of that which knows it. Therefore, the investigation into our true nature is the highest endeavor any human being can engage in. In fact, to engage in any investigation other than the investigation into our true nature will always lead to disappointment. Because everything we know is a reflection of the nature of that which knows it. If we think I am a temporary finite self, in other words, if we think I am a body-mind, all our knowledge, however refined our knowledge may be, will be an extrapolation or an expansion of that belief. In other words, everything the finite mind knows is predicated on the belief that the mind's essential nature is temporary and finite. Therefore, if anyone truly wants to know what the mind, the body, or the world is, they first have to know the nature of consciousness. That is why the science of consciousness is the ultimate science. It is more essential than the science of physics or psychology or biology or chemistry. So how are we going to find out more about the nature of ourselves? We obviously have to ask the one that knows ourself. What is it that knows ourself? Itself. The only way to find out anything about the essential nature of ourself is to go to that. It is not to read a book or listen to a teacher. Nobody can give us 
knowledge about ourselves. Others can give us hints or clues about where to look or, more importantly, how to look. But if we want to know for ourselves, from first-hand experience about ourselves, it's just between ourself and ourself. There is no room for anyone else in that relationship. <coughs> it is between you and yourself. If the Buddha were to show up here this morning and you were to have the option of giving your attention to the Buddha or giving your attention to yourself, I would recommend the latter. <laughs> and I think he would agree. <laughs> So give your attention to yourself now. Be aware of the experience of being aware. phrase, give your attention to the experience of being aware, is a little misleading, because it's only, only possible to give our attention to something with objective qualities. So the phrase, give your attention to yourself, or give your attention to the experience of being aware, is just a concession to the object knowing mind. So it's not really a, a giving of our attention or a directing of the attention. It is rather a relaxing of the attention. The experience of being aware is at the source of attention. It can never be the object or destiny of attention. In other words, the source of attention, the experience of being aware, cannot be found with the attention. It is rather a relaxation of the attention. A sinking of the attention, not a rising of the attention. In other words, the attention doesn't find its source, it dissolves in its source. That is meditation, the essence of meditation. the sinking of attention into its source. Being aware 
of being aware. If you seem to lose touch with a simple experience of being aware, one of the most direct paths back to this non-objective experience is to simply ask yourself the question, am I aware? Pause and then answer yes. The question Am I aware is a thought. The answer yes is a thought. But between these two thoughts, in other words, outside the mind, something takes place. We become aware that we are aware. In fact, we don't become aware that we are aware Rather, we notice the experience of being aware, which was previously veiled as a result of directing our attention towards an object. So that you then ask yourself the question again a second time, am I aware? Pause. And stay in the pause. Stay as the pause. Thank you.